I wanted to talk this morning, many are called, few are chosen. Now, what makes a man called, and how come people don't get into the chosen? And it's on that I want to talk about. How come some people start off fine and vanish? How come some people don't get in? Straight is the gate, narrow the way, few there be that find it. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. How come people that started well let themselves get sidetracked and in the end go wrong? How come people who should know don't know? How come the religious people in Jesus' day were so against truth? How come they all went to church or synagogue? What is it in people that gets them to go wrong? How come you can be in a church and you can watch, and, and I have done over, I don't know, I suppose it's 43 years now. I, I watched people go wrong, and then I wondered why. People that should never go wrong, go wrong. Uh, and what started them on the slide, what got them on the slide, what stopped them, and they slither down. And, and you know, it, it's a terrible thing. See someone begin well and vanish. And, and when you start looking at scripture, you realize what happened. Because the Bible makes everything plain. You know, uh, when a person goes wrong, and people go wrong, there's a reason. Always a reason. And the grace of God is a gift. And he's able to keep us from falling. But that doesn't mean you can't walk away because you're stupid. And some people have that gift. It's so important to understand how people get it wrong. And all over the world today, you've got preachers standing up promising people wealth and health and prosperity and and they forget that health, wealth, and prosperity come from one person, Jesus Christ. Don't come by what I do, they come by what he does. God gives wealth. It's not something you do, it's something God does. Um, and God lifts up and God, you know, it, my Bible says that if you being evil know how to give your children good gifts. How much more shall your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Well, one thing you have to understand, you better make sure God is your Father before you start asking. Because if it, Heavenly Father isn't your Father, and you start asking for something, you're likely to get something wrong. And that's why a lot of people end up with the wrong thing. If you ask your Father, bread, he's not going to give you a stone, make sure he's your father. So we're talking family. Uh, and I want to talk about family because the church is a family and God's our father. Uh, and we're not trying to struggle to believe, that's nonsense. If you struggle to believe, get born again. If you're not born from above, you can't enter in, you won't see the kingdom of God, you can't enter into the kingdom of God, that's the end of it. Is that plain? You know, it's there in the book. I find so many people, they have this idea that Christianity is a struggle. If it's a struggle, then it's you doing it, not God. You're in trouble. That's why all over the world today, men love to struggle. They love to put in the effort. Of course, God looks at them and thinks of them as stupid. Because, you know, you don't do what only God can do. Can't do it. One word. Can't make God.
do something by kind of going on at him. There are people who think that they can nag God to get what they want. They go after things and they think, if I pray enough, I ask God enough, I'll get what I want. Well, let me tell you something. We're here to fulfill God's will in the earth, not ours. We're here to do what God wants, not what we want. We're here to be servants of the living God, not to make God our servant. Is that plain? I find so many people, they have an idea that if they fast and pray and seek God, they can get what they want. Well, I've got news for you. It's not going to work. Now, how do people get into a state where they miss God completely? How do they get into a state where they actually think that they're hearing, but they're not? How do they get into a state where they think they're going right when they're so wrong? What is it? Now, with Jesus, they had all their kind of explanations of why he was wrong, but he was right. Religious people had all their ideas of what was wrong and they missed it by a million miles. Now you've got all over the world today kind of strange doctrines come up. Strange teachings. Uh, and they're deadly. What they want is to tell you, hey, you've got to do this, this and this, or you know, you, do, you, you, you um, can get away with it. You can't. In the end, you know, a Christless eternity waits for those who really gather the wages. The wages of sin is death. No good being a skeptic. You can sit there as much as you like and be skeptical, but in the end, hey, what's going to judge you is the word of God. You can think what you like and think you want freedom, but what's going to judge you is the word of God. Touchstone of truth. In the end, there, there is going to be a very definite facing up. Is that plain? Now, for those who walk in the way of Christ, totally different. The only thing you, you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ for is for reward. The, you know, the great white throne will not be your place. It will be the judgment seat of Christ to receive rewards for what you've done. Uh, and that's what I like. Jesus didn't want people to, uh, the religious people to understand. You know, my Bible says, take heed how you hear. Got to take heed heed then he says what you hear it, it depends what you feed on as to what you become you know the bottom feeders that's the the fish down and the crabs and the lobsters they they feed on dead things I I know a lot of Christians who are death things live at the bottom of the sea and the sea is sin Uh, and whilst they come to church, they, they, they actually feed uh, and their nourishment comes from all the wrong things. They grow sick in mind. See, it's what you hear, how you hear, uh, uh, and what you think. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What well, you think by what you hear. Feed on the wrong things and you get sick. If you feed on the wrong food, you'll make yourself ill. Now, Christians have an allergy to the wrong things. See, that's why they get sick in their mind. They should have a proper allergy to it. And you can watch because the joy vanishes, the peace vanishes, life vanishes from them because they're feeding on that which is killing them. And it's apparent, just looking at them, exactly where they are. Nothing you can do will change it. They just choose where they feed. 
And there are some people with a gift of feeding on the wrong things. Now, if you're one of those that's automatic, it's, oh, this is too negative for me. Well, you're the very one I'm talking to. You need to listen. There's a good gospel, but how are you going to continue in it if you feed on the wrong things? You see, we're born again of the incorruptible word of God, but if you listen to corruption, you're going to get messed up. You see, life is in Christ. It's not in some idea, some notion, certainly not in family, certainly not in friends who live the wrong way, certainly not in the wrong things. Life is in Christ. He is life. Is that plain? Uh, and the enemy who wants to destroy, he works a way to get you to listen to the wrong voice. And when you listen to the wrong voice, you're on your path to destruction. There are some people who have a gift of destroying. And they come with the most credible, logical, and destructive power. And they destroy. It's been so throughout the whole of history. And you have to wake up because our God is a good God and wants you to feed on what's right, whatsoever things are pure, just, and a good report. And if you feed on things that aren't, you're going to get yourself in bother. Now, if you listen to the wrong voice, when the serpent came to try Jesus, he came with plausible things. Hey, you're hungry. Well, I'll tell you a solution for that. Turn these stones into bread. Had he the power to do it? Yeah, sure he could. Should he do it? No, he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Oh, so life and life sustenance comes not from man, but from the mouth of God. Number one, always remember the source of life. It's not from what you know from other people, it's what you know from God. And then he says, look. <laughs> he says, I want to show you all the glories of this world. Takes him up into a high mountain and says, look, you can have it all. One little condition. You know, you're kind of a worshipping person. <laughs> you know, all you've got to do is fall down and believe that the one who can give you all this is me. It's amazing how many people are worshipping the devil for their wealth and their riches and their prosperity and don't realize they've got the wrong God and they're worshipping the wrong spirit. And they fall down. Now, you're worshipping the devil for what he can do for you. And how many people present God in that way? So you find they're there and really the love of money which is the root of all evil has taken hold in their hearts and they've actually ended up <laughs> listening to the wrong thing. You know, life comes from the mouth of God. It, it doesn't come from things you possess. It comes from things you possess. Then you, you, you miss God by a million miles. Is that plain? And yet many people are crowding to churches because they're told, you know, well, 
the, the seven rules of business, seven steps to success, seven this, seven that, you know, or six or five or four. Uh, and it's all business skin schemes, uh, and all it is is devil worship. The God of this world you're worshipping. Now, he said he had the power to give it. The strange thing is that it's a lie. Because he didn't have the power to give it. Because Jesus Christ holds all things in the power of his hand, and he has all authority in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. The devil had no authority. What a con trick. But Jesus didn't believe him. He said, hey, there's only one you should worship. You know, I see people think they're successful because they've got money in the bank, a big house, a flash car, and aren't they clever? No, because it's going to take them to hell if they're not careful. Woe betide you rich men, it says. Go how? It's amazing how many people want to queue up for it. Worshipping the devil. And when you tell them that, they get offended. Especially when they come to church. Huh. Me worshipping? No, no, no. I tell you this, it's more important what's in their pay packet than what Christ wants. And then you think, well... Love of money is what? Root of all evil. God finds people out. You know how, how they're found out by the way they behave. You always tell people who've gone wrong. Terrible, really. But... Um, they don't like being challenged or confronted uh, and, you know, they'll make a nice religious excuse. Well, you know, uh, you know uh, very, very kind of um, uh, negative. Life doesn't consist in what you have or haven't got. Life consists in a person, Jesus Christ, and every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Father. All right? Hello? And then... He takes him up into a high, uh, on the top of the temple. He says, throw yourself off. Hey, you can prove who you are. You know, cast yourself off the temple. You know, spectacular displays in God. So I just want to get your minds thinking. Turn to the person next to you say, he's talking to me, not you. You know, I want you to know, concentrate. I, it's not the person next to you. Though you might think they need to hear it. Uh, probably they do. I, I'm talking to you as individuals, all right? Each one. Hmm? Okay, listen to this. We, we're going to look at some scriptures. Okay. Matthew 13, verse 24 Another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, there appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then we go and gather the nut? And he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye first, together first the tares, and bind them in bundles, and burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. I, I used to, and still do, love to walk 
walk um, in the fields. Something about walking in fields. I like to be out there. I don't worship nature, but I like to walk in fields. Do you know something? And here's something I want you to figure out. When tares are sown in a cornfield, the greatest height and the most prominent thing are the tares. They grow right above the wheat. So to any untrained eye, it would be the tares that are most successful. The very thing that the enemy has sown appears the most prominent thing in growth. That's what's so deadly. You can be conned by people who promise you things and they sow ideas and strangely enough those ideas become the most prominent things in your life. And it seems they're going to be the most successful. Unfortunately, what they're producing is destructive beyond belief. And if you try and separate the wheat and the tares, you've got a problem because you're going to destroy some of the wheat. And you'll find they'll grow way above the wheat. That's what's so deceptive about error. It apparently grows quicker. But the nature of it is destructive. The enemy comes in the night when you sleep. You see, for a Christian not to be awake is folly. Because all the time, the enemy of our souls seeking to sow seed in the heart that's going to destroy us. Seed in the mind. Comes along and he thinks, okay, I can't get them to stop being Christians, so how do I deal with it? And he comes along and he sows seed. And once the seed's in the mind, it grows. And Jesus made plain the seed is the word of God. The corrupt seed is the word of the enemy. <laughs> He's an enemy. Enemy of Christ. And he comes along and he sows seed. And that seed apparently is the most prominent thing. You know Jesus talks about the the seed that falls amongst the thorns and the thistles. And he says it chokes the good seed. Chokes the life out of it. So someone who's begun well suddenly finds he's allowed the enemy to come and sow the seed. It'll choke that life out. Feed on the wrong people, feed on the wrong things. Let me tell you something. Take heed who you get advice from. Get advice from the wrong people who are going to sow the wrong seed. I'll tell you what it'll do, it'll destroy you. And I, <laughs> you know, they'll come with credible credentials. It's amazing who people will take advice of. They talk to them. And they don't realize all the time they're asleep. There are some people, if they told me the time, I'd look for 10 clocks. <laughs> they lie, and that's their spirit. And I don't like, I'm not willing to spend time with them and listen to them because I know what the fruit of it will be. They're not going to get into my life, thank you very much. Enemies don't have part. But what's even worse, what if it's a friend? Mm. 
watch who your friends are. Find it in the Bible. This is the negative part. Hope you don't mind. I'm talking to you, every one of you. See, the world comes along and says, hey, hey, you know, there's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, let me tell you something. There's something wrong with it if it's going to take you the wrong way. What's wrong with modern fashion, people say to me. I'll tell you what's wrong with modern fashion. If it's going to provoke a person to live a wrong lifestyle, it's wrong. Watch out. I love what the Archbishop Benson Edohose used to say. Dress the way you want to be addressed. And some people, they dress like slobs. That's what they become. You say, oh, well, we don't want to be fuddy. I'm not talking about being fuddy, daddy. But there's ways to dress modestly and nicely. And parents have a responsibility to make sure their children do. It's not a choice. It's a responsibility. Is that plain? Uh, and the trouble with society today, the parents don't have any say. Their kids go off and they manipulate their parents and do what they want. It's wrong. Woe betide a family that's cursed with parents like that. Because the parents are a curse, not a blessing. And of course, you know, what's sown in your mind is all this kind of advertising and what's sown in your mind is all the kind of wrong things and you find people live the wrong way and in the end they end up in the wrong lifestyle because that's what they advertise and in the end that's what they'll do and so you have to be disciplined but you know what if a friend is a dangerous voice let's look in the Bible it says in Matthew's gospel chapter 16 and when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now, what I always find amazing is he says who he is. <laughs> and then he says, who do, who do men say I? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist who lost his head, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, Thou, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now the statement was the revelation that was going to be the rock the church was going to be built on, who he was. It's nothing to do with Peter being the rock. It was just a play on words. It goes on, verse 19, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whosoever, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to, unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Hey, just a minute. Here, here's a man who preaches the word of God who has a revelation of God the Father, and the next minute has a revelation from the devil. Yeah. 
You want to take heed who you hear. Should sweet and bitter water come out of the same fountain, asked James. Shouldn't be. There are some people who just dish up the wrong thing. But if you take notice, Jesus rebuked him and said, you don't understand. Now always, we've got to stay awake. Because your best friend can sink you. The one you think has got a revelation from God can sink you. Just because someone seems to be something, watch out. Paul spoke of James, the Lord's brother, he said, and, and the others, and he said, they seem to be pillars in the church. But they went wrong and Paul withstood them to his face, their face. Why? Didn't mean they weren't apostles. What happened, they went a wrong way. And you'll find there's a lot of people who start out right and go the wrong way because they listen to the wrong things. And all the time, the enemy's out there sowing seed. And he's looking for a heart that's responsive to the wrong things. And man alive, does he destroy? And what grows up is all wrong. Hey, why do people invest in stupidity? And our whole country is living a dream that's not true. And I'll tell you what, there's a lot of churches living a dream that's not true. And soon the bubble bursts. And then you say, just a minute, it wasn't what we thought. There's an enemy sowing seed all over. He's out to destroy. What's he destroying? He's destroying our freedoms. Freedom of thought. Freedom of expression. Our whole society has got it wrong. And the church of Jesus Christ is there to stand and say, just a minute. Hey, the most creative people in the whole of society, in the whole of the earth are Christians. We should be the head and not the tail. We shouldn't be there running after the wrong things. We should be living by the right things. Why? Because Christ lives in us. We have the creator of heaven and earth living within us. And we need to clear our minds. And we need to be awake, not asleep. Every moment of every day, you're bombarded with thinking. You're bombarded with ideas. Every waking moment, you turn on the television, and no matter what you're trying to watch, they bombard you with adverts, thoughts. And here's Peter, <laughs> impetuous Peter. Hey, he's totally besotted with the wrong idea. One minute, revelation from God, next minute he's following the devil. Blame culture is part of culture. You know, that's, that's what the devil does. He blames someone. When sin comes, the first thing Adam and Eve did was blame people. Blame is shifting responsibility. Hey, today you are where you are because that's your fault. You're not there because someone else did it to you. You're not there because of your upbringing. You're not there because of your lack of education. You're not there because of too much education. You're there because that's what you want to be. Is that plain? You are responsible for you. No point in saying, well, it's someone else. Hey, you got yourself into the hole. You need a savior 
to change you, get you out. But I want to tell you, if you try and dig your own way out, you'll only make your grave deeper. Life's in Christ. He's the only hope for us. It isn't in anything other than the reality of Christ. Is that plain? And Jesus answered in Matthew 22. I, I, I like it when the Bible says Jesus answered. You know, fancy answering when no one's asked you a question. He often did. I, I like the way the Bible is so specific. One answers, they're all in the Bible. And Jesus, um, in Matthew 22, verse 1, says, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son. And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise, and the remnant took his servants, and entreated them spitefully, and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then said he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Now why weren't they worthy? Because when it was time to go and feast on the right things of God, they were too busy feasting on their own things. They made light of it. Verse 5, went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. They didn't like it. And the remnant took the servants and slew them. They didn't like You know, the man of God, if you want to know what it is to be a preacher, the one that gets attacked most is a preacher. You know, it's easy to blame the preacher. Really is. You see, the one thing a preacher does if he stands up for truth, they all blame Jesus. You know, you've got a problem. You didn't wash your hands before your meal. Mind you, he didn't get sick. Just shows you. You didn't conform to what people thought was the spiritual norms. Non-conformists. Your language wasn't the language that we know. We're learned. It's amazing excuses that people will come up with, you know, because they don't like the vessel. You know, the real problem was Jesus was the Word made flesh. Now, if he'd come down as spirit and walked as an angel, they wouldn't have had a problem. But he was spirit in word, in flesh. And that's where the problem comes. See? Because no matter what way you slice the pie, humanity will blame humanity. It's amazing how loud destructive when people listen to the wrong thing. How, how, how can you let an enemy come in and sow in your mind? Well, I tell you, it's when men slept. And I find Christians go to sleep. They're not aware. Now, Paul said we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. But I find Christians are so stupid and ignorant. It's time to wake up. What causes destruction? I'll tell you what causes destruction. A little sitting down, a little folding of the hands, poverty comes. And in the spirit realm, and in the natural realm, when you listen to the wrong voices, you get the wrong ideas. And when you get the wrong ideas, you go the wrong way. And when you go the wrong way, you become the wrong thing.
broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many go in that way. Why? Because they listen to the wrong thing. Uh, it's time to wake up. If every Christian would just wake up. When the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers, we're in verse 7, and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go you therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all, as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, few are chosen. You might look at that and say, hey, you know, he got to the wedding feast. There was a good and bad call to the wedding feast. How come he came without a wedding garment? Well, let me explain it to you in simple terms. You see, there's two types of righteousness in the earth. Self-righteousness, which a lot of people have, and Christ as our righteousness. And when Christ is your righteousness, you fit. When you're called, and many were invited, good and bad, God calls the things that are not as though they were. And, and to come into the wedding feast, all they had to do was realize they weren't worthy. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people who come to church who think they are worthy in their own selves. We have no worthiness. Christ is our righteousness. Christ is our holiness. Christ is our redemption. Christ is our Savior. He's everything. Uh, this guy came in and he thought he was the one who was capable. Hey, the moment you get self-reliance, you've got the wrong garment on. You have to be totally dependent on God. The king invited them. You know, many are called, few are chosen. Do you know why? Because the people that are called don't understand what the calling's to. <laughs> they miss it completely. How can they miss what's so obvious? The calling is to a life. The calling is to uh, let the life of Christ be in you. The calling is to have Christ in you. Not that I live, but he lives in me. The calling is to realize that all my scheming and all my efforts and all isn't going to stand in that day. The only thing that will stand is Christ in his righteousness. And it's his life we have to have. As he is, so are we in this world. It's his life. When we see him, we shall be like him, it said in 1 John. It's Christ. And the trouble is, people are self-righteous instead of having the righteousness of Christ. They're legalistic. Hey, you don't get there because of what you do. You get there because of what he did for you. You don't get there because of self-reliance. You get there because of total dependency on the one who's the source of all life. And the trouble is, there's too many people messing with their lives and thinking they can do it. I've got news for you, you won't make it. You'll destroy yourself because you'll listen to the wrong things, you'll absorb the wrong ideas, and self-destruction's waiting down the road for you. 
And I'll tell you how you know. You look at people and you look at their children and you can see the seed of destruction already in their children because the children aren't smart enough to cover it up. But the seed was listening to the wrong thing. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeds out of the mouth. Now, isn't that plain? Hey, the source of life is God. Our guidance needs to be from Him. Watch out, though. Look at the guidance Peter tried to give to Jesus. Don't go that way. Far be it from. So, you know, just because you think they're qualified, watch out. I see people, lives destroyed because they go and sit down with someone and discuss things and take counsel. And the counsel is a counsel of destruction. They don't realize it, they listen to the devil. And before you know it, they're going down the wrong pathway. And, and no, no amount of reasoning or telling them or warning them, people don't listen. Years ago, years before it happened, I warned everyone that was going to go on contract with computers. I said, watch out, it's all going to end. End nastily. Some people listened, some people didn't. The ones who didn't, found out. But it was five years before it happened. You know, people don't listen because they don't want to hear. You think you know better? Well, go to destruction. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 28 says, The base things of the world and the things which were despised as God chosen, yea, and the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now our Savior, Jesus Christ, is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. God made him that. Let me tell you something. If Christ lives in you, you have the wisdom of God inside you. If Christ lives in you, you have the redemption of God inside you. But I tell you what you need to do, you need to shut your mouth and shut your ears and listen to him. The one thing you don't need to do is take advice from someone who worships money, who worships things, and, and look at the fruit of their lives and how wrong they've gone. Don't listen to them. They'll take you down the same pit. Are you hearing me? Yes. It's wrong. The fruit of a life. You know a man by the fruit they produce. And there are people, their lives show what they are, and yet I find people don't realize, hey, just a minute. There's a right way to live and a wrong way to live. And our Christ, no flesh is going to glory in his presence. Hey, it's God. God did it. God spoke it. God built it. But when man puts his hand in, I'll tell you what happens, confusion. When man starts, it goes wrong. Why do they leave God? They listen to the wrong voice. They align themselves with the wrong thing. They fellowship with the wrong people. They listened to a devil. That's what gets them in the mess. And you notice the people that were invited to the wedding feast, they treated it lightly. I find some people treat the word of God so lightly, they're careless about getting to the meeting on time. They're careless about listening on time. They're careless in their life. God doesn't come first. 
Their love of money comes first. Their love of things comes first. Their love of self comes first. And I'll tell you what happens. They're on the road to destruction because they'll listen to all the wrong voices and they won't pay heed. Listen to me. The person that doesn't take God lightly is the person you want to be near. You want to see who's faithful. Not someone who puts God on as a little extra, but the man who diligently heeds what God says because man shall live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Where's the source of life? So I want to make sure I take every opportunity to have life from God. I see people come on Sunday only. Okay, you want to come on Sunday only? It shows how lightly you take God. When I was a young man, every weekend, I'd get in my car, I'd drive 300, 400 miles it was, every weekend. Why? So I could hear the word of God because what inspired my soul was the things of God. I'd drive back overnight to be in work on a Monday morning. Why? Because the thing that I cherished most was the field where the pearl of greatest price was. And I was going to have that pearl. I gave my life for it. I didn't end up a preacher because I was careless. I took it so diligently because all my soul was bound in it. And I see people so careless. And I know you're going to be cast out of the wedding. Even if you get in, you'll be bound hand and foot because you'll be dressed in your own smugness. <laughs> Careless. Or you won't even bother. You'll turn around and say, oh well. I'm busy. I'm making money. Money, money, money. That's what I'm doing. And the word of God, the source of all life, becomes irrelevant. Let me tell you, when I was ill, I got a viral infection in Argentina. If I could stand, I got to the meeting. If I, if I, I preached, when I had to hold on to the pulpit so I could stand standing up, but was I going to give in? No. Was I going to lie down and die? No. I tell you what I treasure. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Did I go off on holiday? No. I stayed. Year after year, my wife and I stayed. We didn't. You know why? Because I had a task to do. What is the most precious thing? God the Father. Man shall live by every word that proceeds out of his mouth. If you don't bother to take note of it and you don't value it, I'll tell you what will happen. And that's why people go wrong. That's why they end up wrong. That's why they end up sick. That's why they end up diseased. That's why they end up messed up in their minds, messed up in their businesses, messed up in life. Sooner or later, he'll come home to roost. And God says, you know, I'll destroy the cities they've built. I'll destroy what they've got. He did. He sent them and destroyed it. They built. They built. They built. They thought they're okay until the king sent. He'll knock down your castle, buster. And the reason he's knocking down your castle is he's trying to wake you up. Not that he wants to destroy. No. But he wants to wake you up to see what you're doing. You're destroying yourself, your family, the future. Our God is a good God. He's on our side. He wants to be our wisdom, our righteousness. Hey, how are you going to get wisdom if you don't spend time and devote yourself to what's proper? What is valuable in your life? You see, what you treasure, what you really treasure, is where your heart is. I treasure the church of Jesus Christ because 
He's building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I love it. Hey, we are secure and safe because the gates of hell don't stand a chance. Turn on to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. Verse 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that's Jesus, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We're made the righteousness of God, not by what we do, but by what Christ did 2,000 years ago. Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, and verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Every one of us has grace, undeserved favor. Everyone. It's not uh, some have more grace, some have less grace. Some have no grace. Everyone has. You know, God's grace is sufficient that you're still alive. That the whole of creation provides you with food, nourishment, fresh air. Hey, there's a lot of things that the grace of God provides you with every day. And you need to appreciate everyone's got grace, undeserved favor from God. Now, it's not sufficient to say, well, what can I do? Hey, I'll tell you what you can do. You can be wise in what you receive. God gifted me life. I want to use my life for him. God gifted me health. I want to use my strength for him. God caused me to stand. I want to honor him. I think people forget the source of things and think it's somehow their own efforts. Well, it isn't. 1 John 4, verse 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You remember I read it out the other day. It's you try the spirits. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Do you know how I overcome lies? With truth. Do you know how I overcome it? With understanding. Do you know how I get it? Greater is he that's in me. I rely on revelation from God. I know what God will bring about. I can see what's going to come. People don't understand. You live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of. It's not your wisdom, your intelligence, your skill. We're Christians. He's made unto us wisdom. He is our wisdom. I find too many people, their schemes come unstuck because it's their schemes, not God. Woe betide you when you listen to women. They'll scheme. Woe betide you when you listen. They'll scheme. Woe betide you when you listen to anything but the voice of God. You say, well, isn't there wisdom in men? No. There's destruction. There's a way that seemeth right unto man. The end thereof is... Life is about going God's way. My life is committed to Him. I live for Him. I don't care what the world thinks. I don't care what man thinks. I care that I've got to take it seriously. I can't take it lightly. Why? Because the God who gave me life is the God I love, the God I serve. And I always am aware that he gave me life. And the older I get, the more aware I am that I depend on him. Who knows? Life is but a fleeting moment. We can't govern ourselves and say, well, you know, we can do it. Hey. What are we going to leave behind for our children's children? What are we going to leave behind as a heritage? 
What are we going to embrace? I look at people, see, you know, the things that are valueless, they value. Because their minds are corrupted. Wake up. Verse 9 of, of, of Philippians. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. But I would that you should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Boy, he says, everything's working a positive thing. Why? Because it's set on Christ, filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Christ. And in Colossians um, 1, you get this in verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. You know, we've got, we're partakers of an inheritance. We've already got it. We're partaking it now. We're not waiting some time. And if you go to sleep, you live not in what God's given you. You live in the lie. If you allow the devil to guide you instead of God, if you allow greed to guide you instead of God, if you allow your own desires to guide you instead of God, you end up in tragedy. You make it for yourself. You might not get it the first day because the tares will look as though they're prospering more than the true wheat. That's the trouble. Trying to convince someone who's going wrong that it's wrong is crazy because I tell you, you've just got to let them grow together and at the end you know there's going to be destruction. The only thing you can do is face people up and challenge people. And then you know they'll hate you for it. Great. Who wants the job? People don't like it. You know, you can see the future, you can see what's coming, and you can't turn them. And Paul said, woe is me if I don't preach. But heck, what do you do to a madman that's going into a lake of fire, and you tell them and tell them and tell them and tell them, and they still jump in? What do you do to a madman who sets himself to destroy himself and his family? What do you do? It's by the foolishness of preaching men are saved. Lord alone knows. You just carry on preaching and think, well, God, it's your responsibility. There are some people that are as blind as blind can be. And you think, well, what, what do you say to them? <laughs> You're going that way, it's going to end in hell. They don't care. They take it lightly. I don't want to take it seriously. Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. Verse 10. For we are what? His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God's created you for something. Good works. God hasn't created you to make a million. You might make it as a byproduct. God created you to do something faithful. And you forgot. God created you with a purpose. You're created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And the good work is to fulfill his will. 
Not your will, not your desires, but his. Is that plain? Hello? You're glad you came, aren't you? Fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love of one accord, of one mind. Fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. You know, you've got to be of one mind. I find there's some people who their only gift in life is to be a blithering nitpicker. They always have their own little opinion. And the, <laughs> Paul writes to Colossian church, Hey, fulfill my joy. I like people who are of one heart and one mind, not, not someone who's got their mind filled with the devil's thoughts. The devil goes about to kill, to steal, to destroy. Christ has come to give us life, and life more abundant. Huh? You know, there are some nitpickers. Watch out. Watch how they do in business. Watch. I, I, I watch just in the natural thing. They'll fall out with boss after boss after boss, and you suddenly realize, hey, there, there, there's, a, there's a great kind of natural tendency to do it. It's the boss that's wrong. This boss is wrong. That boss is wrong. I don't like this. I don't like... And you find it becomes a pattern in their life. And when it comes to the church, it'll be the same pattern. They don't come to church and get different. They're the same in... You know. There are people like that. There are people that have a gift of falling out because they're smarter than everyone. Of course, they're not the ultimate boss, although they do think they're God. But they always fall out, uh, and you see patterns in, uh, evolving in people's lives. And I, I see it now. Uh, it take me years to wake up to a pattern in their lives. Terrible, isn't it? We'll go to Colossians 2-2 two, two as well. That your hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Where are they? In Christ. They're not in your brain. You want to know where wisdom comes from? It comes from God. You want to know where all the treasures are? They're in God. They're not in you. They're not in your ability. They're in Christ. Boy, 3, Colossians 3. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not, on things of the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. Where are you to set your affections? Things above, not on things of the earth. Things down here don't matter. Things up there do. Now, if you set your affections right, your life will be right. But so many people set their affections down here. They live for this life. They don't realize, hey, we're to set our affections. Why? Because we're dead. We have life in Christ. Everything's in Christ. And if you don't get that right, you miss everything. I find people, they just end up things, experiences. They think life is going out there and listening to some pop group. That's not life. It's no salt on your eardrums. And, and then they go out and think nightclubs. And then they think, you know, that's not life, it's death. Life's in Christ. 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3. What does verse 20 say? 
And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are... See, there's so many people think they're smart. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And you are Christ, and Christ is God's. Amen? Don't glory in man, you glory in God. And 2 Corinthians 9. Verse 6 says this, And this I say, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart. So let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which cause which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. Now, every man, you know, the most important thing to sow in your life is your life. You know, if you lay down your life, seek first the kingdom of righteousness. If you realize your life belongs to God, First and foremost, God has everything. I live for God. If you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. I find some people, they give so little to God, they've got nothing back. It's not to do with money, it's to do with living. It is to do with money as well, because part of your life, you earn your money by giving your life, don't you? You actually should be paid for what you do. But basically, when you give to God, you're giving your life when you give your money. Fact. But I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about life. You know, what, what is important is how I devote my life, what I devote it to. doesn't mean you give up your job but you make sure that you do things in righteousness and you live for God everything's dependent on that I have gotta live we're here to honor him we're here to be disciples of the living God we're not here to live for ourselves we've got to live with integrity with sincerity is that plain Every one of you, I'm talking to each one, so important to understand. Hey, God is a good God. He's given us the life of Christ. Is there anything greater than the life of Christ? Christ in you, the hope of glory. We have this treasure in an earthen vessel that we might squander it and do despite to it and take it for granted and treat it lightly. Or do we treat it as a treasure most precious? God wants us to be honorable. Honorable in all things. So sparingly, you reap sparingly. God wants us to give our lives, whole lives, to him. Would to God everyone could hear. Would to God... they would obey. Father, I just pray for each one here. Lord, if ever there was a need for Christians to wake up, 
Awake out of your sleep. Wake up to what the enemy has done in lives and hearts. He's come and sown false ideas, false notions. The wisdom of man which ends in a snare. The wisdom of God is our source of life. Lord, you are the source and fount of all wisdom. You are the source of life. And we would magnify thee. Your word is made flesh in us. Lord, you come to quicken our beings, to transform our lives, to loose the bands that bound, to break the chains. You've promised that what God the Father has not planted will be rooted up. That we'll have good seed, an understanding heart, a knowledge of who you are and what you've come to do. Oh, Master, Lord, open every eye. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Unstop the ears that are deaf and wax and gross. Root up the things that harm and destroy. And let your life flow in. Lord, let that spirit of life quicken every part of every being as you promised. It's a gift from you and we receive so simply from this day. Lord, let that life flow. Unstop the wells that have been stopped up. Remove the stone upon the very fount of life. You came to give us life and life more abundant. You came to release us to make us grateful for who you are and what you've done. You came to make us worshippers, worshippers of the great God. You created us for good works, to be what you wanted us to be in the earth. You gave us this treasure in an earthen vessel that the excellency of the power would be of you. Lord, you gave us such wonderful gifts and we've come to honor you, to praise your name, to give you thanks. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love, your grace. Thank you for who and what you are. Precious Holy Spirit, quicken each one.
Lord, I just pray that the words spoken will go home to accomplish what you sent it to do. Let us not treat your word lightly, nor what you've done lightly. But let us be those that treasure the greatest treasure of all, your life, your keeping power, your grace, your love. Lord, I just pray for each one here. Don't let them get turned out of the way by those who would subvert. Don't let them get led astray. Of all those you've given us, let not one be lost. Keep them, I pray. and your love and your grace.